Hello, I am Pastor Eliezer. I'm the senior pastor at Trinity United Methodist Church here in Frederick, Maryland. And I have the blessing and honor to introduce uh, Dr. Donald Fine. He is a, a, a biologist by training, and he has been working, and he has worked before retiring uh, on uh, infectious diseases. And he has written a piece that we have in our website on the issue of the coronavirus and, uh, and how to uh, help folks prevent uh, being infected by this virus. Uh, and information that I believe will be helpful and useful for everyone in the congregation and also in the larger community. Um, so we have been blessed to have him in the church. He is a member of Trinity United Methodist Church and has been a member for many years. And he is uh, one of the persons who serves in our church council as one of the church council chairs. Um, but today he's not coming to use the church council chair. He comes as a person who has expertise in the subject of, um, of, uh, of viruses. And I think you're, you're going to enjoy his presentation and indeed his knowledge. So without further ado, uh, our brother in Christ, uh, Don Fine. I trust that in things that I'm going to be talking about today that uh, this will be of a benefit and of a blessing uh, to all those who hear it. Um, let's first describe what is a virus. It's a non-living, extremely small organism that's invisible to the naked eye. And as such, the only way for a virus to be able to re reproduce itself is by entering or infecting a susceptible living cell such as the cells of a human being. This human individual becomes the host then for the virus, and the host then, in the host, the virus can reproduce itself to high levels. That infected individual can then go on to spread the virus to a new person. Viruses differ from other infectious agents, such as bacteria, which do not necessarily have to enter a living cell in order to reproduce. And it's this difference is the way that a virus replicates. And when compared to other microorganisms, it's fundamental to what medical treatments or approaches can be used to stop the spread of a virus such as the coronavirus disease. The current virus, which is causing this worldwide disease, is called strain COVID-19, or COVID-19. It's a member of the coronavirus family. COVID-19 is not in the influenza family, commonly called the flu viruses. But other viruses in the coronavirus family are the common cold, which, uh, as well as other more serious respiratory diseases, such as SARS and MERS. The coronavirus, like the, vi like the flu viruses, are of an animal origin. That means they have existed in an inapparent infection in their natural host, which could either be a wild or domestic animal. And when that virus develops the ability through mutation or genetic change to move from its natural host into another host, it causes an apparent or overt disease in a new host, such as the case with the coronaviruses. I would like to repeat my previous statement coronaviruses most likely have been present on Earth for literally thousands of years. But these new strains of virus, such as the coronavirus uh, COVID-19 and the seasonal influenza viruses, have developed by way of a genetic change in their ability to infect new hosts, such as humans. In the case of COVID-19, its genetic change enables it to efficiently enter and reproduce in the susceptible cells of the respiratory system, such as the lung. And while it would appear that persons of all ages are susceptible to COVID-19, it's most harmful to elderly persons or persons whose immune system is compromised. And because of its uniqueness, there is no natural immunity to COVID-19 in the world and no current vaccines to protect against it. Because the length of time which is required for development and testing of a vaccine for COVID-19, which will be both safe and effective, during that time our medical experts and researchers are using two other basic approaches 
which have been effective in past epidemics. The first is physical isolation of susceptible individuals from the possible infection. And second, the treatment of known infected persons with drugs that have been successful in treating other diseases. Regarding its origin, this particular strain of coronavirus, COVID-19, appears to have first been identified in China in the fall of 2019. However, it's difficult to say when, where, and how the very first person became infected. As far as its origin, scientific evidence over the years strongly suggests that individuals who live in very close contact with wild or domesticated animals, such as li live fowl in marketplaces in the orient oriental countries, are prone to become infected with these viruses, such as the coronaviruses. The transmission of viruses from animals to humans is well recognized in medical literature. So the host range, which means the various animals in which the virus can re replicate, of COVID-19 is still yet to be clearly determined, but it would appear at this time that pets are not readily susceptible to becoming sick with COVID-19. However, it might be possible for the virus to be carried on animal fur if the pet came in close contact with an infected individual. Thus, the primary mode for coronavirus transmission is from what we call direct contact. That is, a person who is already infected with a virus, such as touching, hutching, hugging, or in close proximity to a sick person who is coughing or sneezing. Or it could be spread indirectly when a person comes into indirect contact with the virus, which has been also inadvertently deposited on a physical surface, such as a contaminated doorknob or perhaps a gas pump. While COVID-19 basically replicates in a respiratory system, such as the lung and the nose of an infected in human, it is likely that the virus can be spread by other routes of, of infection. Sexual transmission or eating food and beverages has not been demonstrated, but alternate routes of infection are yet to be determined. Thus, personal isolation, such as staying home, is the best way to avoid coming into contact either directly or indirectly with the virus. Good hygiene is also important in protecting yourself against infection with COVID-19, whether you come in contact with the virus or not. Regular hand washing, soap and water, hand sanitizers, alcohol wipes will all remove or inactivate the virus from your hands should you inadvertently get it on your hands. Furthermore, by avoiding rubbing the, your eyes, touching your nose reduces the likelihood that the virus will come in contact with the moist surfaces of your body, in particular your nose, your mouth, and your eyes. These are called the portals of entry for viruses, such as the coronaviruses. Regarding eating food or drink which is contaminated, this is a possible route of infection, but it's yet to be ruled out. So caution should be taken not to share food which has come into contact with a person who is ill, just as you would not do if a family member were sick with a cold. While the clinical symptoms of COVID-19 are similar to the seasonal flu and or the common cold. It appears that they are more serious clinically than those viruses. There are some factual explanations for this. However, some of these remain to be confirmed. As an example, it would appear that COVID-19 has the affinity as an infecting agent to infect certain portions of the lung which other respiratory viruses do not as such, it's more dangerous for older individuals or persons who, whose immune system have been weakened, which is often referred to as immune compromise. And while younger adults who contract the virus are less likely to die from COVID-19, the data that's been collected thus far indicate that ages 12 to 54 are being infected at a higher rate than the very young as well as the very older persons.
Not only does this put other young adults who they associate with at increased risk of infection, it also puts at risk their families and older persons that they come in contact with. And because it takes several days for the person who has been infected to exhibit signs of illness, that person can still transmit the virus to others because the virus is rapidly multiplying inside that infected person during that time. Persons who have been ill and continue to show symptoms of illness should stay apart, that is physically isolate from friends or family members, at least until all symptoms have subsided. For more precise answers to this question, I urge you to look to cdc.gov point coronavirus. And until then, and until we have further guidance on this, um, from our outside, U I mean, from our US health officials regarding the transmissibility of the virus, common sense should prevail. For example, don't venture out, don't venture out into public until you have fully recovered from this virus or any other transmissible virus. So you may ask, why does it take so long for a vaccine to be developed for COVID-19? And when will a vaccine be available to the general public? Well, let me take note that in our country, approval of new biological products such as vaccines require our Food and Drug Administration approval before that project can be used to treat healthy individuals. This commonly requires a series of tests to show that the vaccine is both safe as well as effective. In the past, these tests take months to complete. So it is important to understand that a vaccine is only used to prevent infection, not to treat those who are infected. Thus, the major focus now in our country is the treatment of individuals infected, not prevention of infection. Perhaps the good news, there appears to be several medications or med medicines that are previously licensed for other use that are available to treat COVID-19. One of these potential treatments is a family of drugs which has been shown effectively to be used in treating malaria. If these diseases, if these drugs, I'm sorry, are effective and they are being studied in small clinical trials right now, they will certainly help to reduce the severity of the COVID-19 epidemic. Researchers are also quickly testing the effectiveness of using convalescent serum in those who have recovered from COVID-19 to treat others who are sick. Currently, there are thousands of diagnostic tests being distributed which are able to determine if persons are infected. And these tests are to be used in the parts of the country most critically hit by the virus. There is also a new self-diagnostic test which will be available soon. Persons without symptoms should not go for testing because the current test is based on finding the virus in your system. Thus, only if the test is positive can the medical community de determine that you have been infected. The new self-administered test for infection is, is currently on its way and will be with us shortly. If you feel isolated as a result of the quarantine, consider going outdoors or participating in an activity which will not bring you close in close contact with others, especially groups of persons. Gardening, hiking, bicycling, walking, jogging, and open air are encouraged. Avoid cl close contact, such as you would find in airline, train, travel, going to restaurants, bars, things such as this. And this is the reason why large gatherings such as in churches, schools, theaters, and athletic events have been canceled. If you are feeling well, there's no need to wear a face mask when you go out in public, as long as you remain six feet or more away from others. On the other hand, if you have symptoms consistent with either the flu or COVID-19 infection, 
you should not venture out in public. Stay at home. Furthermore, because there is a shortage of masks, there should be more these should be more readily available and used prudently by the healthcare workers and others who are working in a closed environment, such as hospitals and clinics, where they may be in close contact with infected or sick persons. The common systems associated with COVID-19 appear to be a fever and dry cough. However, individuals also have been reported with sore throat, fatigue, aches, pains, headaches, shortness of breath, and even diarrhea. Realizing that many of these same symptoms accompany the flu virus and the common cold, individuals having these symptoms, particularly the fever and cough, might consider being tested and taking appropriate measures to prevent the spread of their illness, whatever, to others. You may have heard the word social distancing. This is the space or separation that individuals should attempt to maintain between you and others when you are out of the house. This distance lessens the likelihood that if a person who is ill were to cough or sneeze in your presence, that you would become in contact with the virus, which may or may not be shed from that person. Social distancing differs from the term quarantine which refers to the process which has been used for centuries to prevent disease spread from a specific locale. And this practice was very effective in the past in stopping a number of contagious diseases. In a sense, the intentional isolation of an infected or potentially infected individual or group from coming into contact with other susceptible persons meets this definition of a quarantine. And you may have heard the terms breaking the chain of infection for the coronavirus. This means reducing the transfer of the virus from person to person. Social distancing, hand washing, cleaning of potentially contaminated surfaces, these simple personal daily practices will systematically reduce the spread of coronavirus as well as other viruses to which we are exposed. Lastly, all of the aspects of the coronavirus pandemic are changing literally every day. I encourage all persons to go to cdc.gov slash coronavirus for the latest relevant information on diagnosis, treatment, and the spread of this disease, which is challenging our faith and the strength of our humanity. Thank you.